It's time for Talking Pictures Trivia! A quick friendly reminder, to get through the Lost Woods, go north, west, south, and then west again. Welcome to Talking Pictures Trivia, the podcast in which a group of geographically challenged friends explore movies through trivia as an excuse to keep their friendships alive. I'm one of these friends, Nick, and with me is... Tom. And KJ. Great to have you back as always. Additionally, joining us as a guest for this week is... Rachel. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. Rachel and KJ are married and are both always surprised that Rachel continues to be willing to watch movies recommended by KJ. Rachel joined us for the Afterlife episode last season. Rachel still conveniently likes movies. For those joining us for the first time, we start off each episode with a movie quiz as these pivotal questions will determine who earns today's trivia crown. Then once the fierce competition is over, we follow it up with our famous movie rant where anything goes. KJ, tell us about today's movie. Today, we are going back to 1985 in Japan, which is Showa year 60. 1985 starts Japan's bubble economy, which lasts until roughly 1991. The Hanshin Tigers win the Japan series against the Seibu Lions, and the first group of Japanese astronauts are chosen in August. During all this, Jozu Itami's movie, Tom Popo, is released. Other big movies in Japan in 1985 include Lupin the Third, Legend of the Gold of Babylon, Akira Kurosawa's Ron, Yamata no Orochi no Gyukushu, which is a tokusatsu kaiju fan film, and Godzilla 1985. In Tom Popo, we follow a ramen shop owner named Tom Popo and what seems like a cowboy off the streets named Goro as they try to make the best ramen shop possible. The movie weaves a ton of sketches that explore different aspects of food and Japanese customs, and in the end, we're left with a smile on our face and wishing we had a nice bowl of ramen. Tom, if you had one word to describe Tom Popo, what would it be? Craftsperson. Nick, how about you? Starchy. Rachel? Sensual. And my word would be appetizing. It's time for question one. There is a scene where our ramen troupe are watching an old man eat his noodles in a noodle shop. What did the old man order in the noodle shop? Oh, God. Honestly, does anybody know? <laughs> I have no idea. That whole scene, it's the... It's oh, I can't even talk about it because I might. I'm locked in. I'm locked in too. I I'll. This is the the scene with the vacuum cleaner, right? Yeah. This this is the uh, yep. This is the lead up to. Okay, then I'll lock in. All right, Tom. What do you have? I thought he was like slurping down a lot of noodles, like noodles, and then this there was this like gooey bread stuff that he also made. And I think that's what he choked on. It was like it, it like it looked like dough, but it kind of descended when he when he ate it. I don't know what it is, but it was he was slurping it, it, the the stuff loudly, and then he ate that dough stuff and he choked on it. All right, Rachel. He ordered a handful of small dishes. Um, so there was, I think, at least four different uh, things that he ordered. One of them was noodles. I'm pretty sure it was ramen. Um, the doughy thing that Tom is talking about, I'm pretty sure was mochi, which is actually cooked rice that's then pound really hard um, to smush together. Oh, okay. And so it has that stretchy marshmallowy texture. Okay. Um, and I don't know what was in the other bowls, but I think there was at least four. And Nick? I believe there were three dishes. Two of them were Romani noodle type base dish and the other was this stretchy type dish that he choked on. All right, points for everybody. He ordered exactly what he wasn't supposed to, right? His helper lady that always goes to the bank. <laughs> she, she said, whatever you do, don't get, and it was like three specific things. And then mm -hmm. we cut to the very formal ordering and he <laughs> orders those exact three things <laughs> by the way i didn't take that as her aid i thought that was like his trophy wife that's the vibe i got from that 
but maybe that was just me, like the older man with the younger that that because she's always oh. saying, I'm going to go to the bank. It's like, here, have your food. <laughs> I'm going to go spend your money. Mm-hmm. That's how I took it. Yeah, I, 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 that, I love that scene, not for the food, but the vacuum cleaner. Oh, my God. So for the audience who hasn't who hasn't seen this, he chokes on this this. Um, what is it called again, Rachel? It's a, a rice. I think it's mochi. M-O-C-H-I. Okay, mochi. He chokes in the mochi, and our our main character gets a vacuum cleaner to suck the food out of his throat instead of the the, the Heimlich maneuver. She uses a vacuum cleaner. It's really really funny. That's after they try to flip him upside down. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a complete mess, and she just kind of, you know, as usual, saves the day. Yeah, what I love about it is the uh, the people coming to save him show up with the vacuum cleaner. It's not. Oh, what's wrong with him? Oh, go get the vacuum cleaner. It's like, oh yeah, we got to get. She those. just the whole runs and grabs a vacuum cleaner, and like, <laughs> yeah. and like it was just lying there in case of emergency. <laughs> you don't remember like that in first aid? <laughs> <laughs> what else I loved about this was the comedy in the entire movie um, was very similar to like a Monty Python. But what they would do is first they would a- they would absolutely and precisely set up the comedy before springing the trap. So you spend a lot of time watching our ramen guys look around that uh, around that half wall at the old man ordering the food. Like we know this is going wrong. We know something terrible is going to happen, but then they keep elevating it up and up and up beyond our expectations. And I really liked how they did that throughout the movie. It was a very precise um form of comedy even though it didn't it, it you know it was still sketch comedy. It still felt loose i agree with you with thinking about monty python that did come across in my brain when i was watching this the different skits and sketches and how they moved from one but still had a a uniform story to go through this whole film but also had these tangential reference points that kind of branched off of that other story what i will say too is i just don't think i have any other Uh, Japanese film reference points that have this style. So to me, it felt, as I said, either some Western comedy, even some of the sound effects made me think of certain Mel Brooks. I don't know if you guys got that, but also Monty Python. So I, I never, I hadn't seen anything from that other type of Japanese cinema that handled that same style. So I, I enjoyed it. I think it was a type of movie to watch with someone else. I watched parts of this movie with KJ and parts of this on my own. And it was definitely funnier when I was watching it with him. Um, the The comedy is very uh, slapstick at times and very exaggerated. And so it felt like um, having someone else giggle would make you laugh and like appreciate the, the silliness of it. Yeah, the, I, I didn't watch it with anybody, but the um the silliness is also kind of organized for the most part uh, what you have is the main line with uh tampupu and this sort of um this story that seems based on shane did i say it wrong tampopo <laughs> popo tampopo <laughs> sorry <laughs> for the audience that couldn't see rachel just lost it and started cracking up on me and then i laughed and then kj laughed yeah tampopo very Um, it was very gentle tom you're like tampopo tampopo. would you like some tampopo ramen i missed that film Mm. (laughs) sorry that's okay yeah uh uh, tampopo you know there's that that main plot but a lot of the the side stories the vignettes and they kind of branch off of it are also sort of about the the kind of um, almost erotic, certainly exaggerated experience of food and how great food is and how lovely it is. But it's also the um, the, the sort of affair of of the amateur. We're never really taken outside of um, Tampopo into the um, into the the professional very often. That seems to be on on her line. A lot of what we're seeing is these kind of slapstick vignettes in which amateurs are enjoying food, sometimes in a highly erotic way, always in an excited way. And it's also they're usually somewhat either on the kind of boundary of acceptable behavior, which makes sense for kind of slapstick 
comedy, um, but they're also like kind of a little bit rebellious a lot of the time. Not the case with the, with the vacuum cleaner, which was just absurd. But you know, you see like the the man with the the bad tooth who ends up giving the kid the ice cream. You know that he he can only eat soft ice cream, and he meets a little kid as he, after he gets his ice cream. There's a little sign on him that says. Um, only give me natural food. And so the man just gives this kid ice cream because the sign says he can't have it. <laughs> That's That spirit is in most, if not all of the vignettes. It's the spirit of the um, of the kind of rebel amateur. The vignette that I particularly enjoyed that really doesn't have much to do with the overall plot was the person, the lady who is teaching them proper etiquette of eating an Italian dish of pasta. <laughs> and she's going through the process about how you don't make any noise because there it's, it's common that people just slurp their noodles up and then that's not the way you eat pasta. And here there's a, a clearly a, a, a Western guy or a European guy and he's sitting there slurping like the loudest you can and she's trying to explain <laughs> that you can't do that. And all of the people, all the young ladies around him just start slurping their pasta and then she even gets in on it. So it's so stupid, but it worked. And, and she's like the closest thing to a villain, right? Like the school marmy follow the rules type person. Um, there's no real villain in this movie, but you know, like that woman is wrong, right? Food and enjoying food, it's you know, it's like something like sex, right? It's it's that kind of, you know, kind of sensual experience in this movie. Um, well, at the same time, being a, a, a discipline, being a craft, something you can appreciate. I also really like the transitions between either vignettes or mm -hmm. from our real story to the vignettes mm -hmm. they were super forced they rarely worked but all of a sudden somebody would be walking by that had nothing to do with what's going on but the camera would follow them to the next vignette for for really no reason like it must have took a lot of effort to to get that together the perfect example of that is the businessman going down the stairs yes. <laughs> when she was uh when Tampopo was running around before like they even like kind of bump into each other <laughs> trying to yeah. force that steam <laughs> and then they're yeah. off to their ordering <laughs> you know and you know what his line is what uh, goro's line is before they go <laughs> he before he bumps into the businessman he says um why the hell am I doing this? <laughs> he's like, why? he's like training this woman to run so she could be a better. Runner. Like, why the hell am I doing this? And then you get this like series of vignettes of people like who are just really into food who are not professionals, right? So it almost it's almost as if I think there's like three vignettes that follow right from there. It's almost like those vignettes answer that question. It reminded me of that movie Crash. I think it was like an Oscar nominated movie a couple years ago mm -hmm. where like everybody yes, sprayed, 2008, yeah. yeah, intersect, but it was like, it was almost like they, they started to do that and they were like, meh, we don't really need to actually make them connect, but we're going to make you think that all these things, I kept waiting <laughs> at the end for it all to like come in. And I was like, yeah, no, we're just really throwing random stories out there. Yeah. It's like the, yeah, that's the, like the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's time for question two. Goro and the drunk that hangs out in Tom Popo's ramen shop have a fist fight one on one. Where does this fight take place? Locked in. Locked in. Locked in. On the side of a highway under an overpass. And there was some train tracks too. So just like a random spot. There was grass or weeds there. And I was also going to say, like it wasn't actually the overpass because the shot, there's nothing like over them, but I feel like they went through an overpass because at one point they were in shadows and then they came out into the sun. So kind of like near a highway after going through an overpass where there's weeds and grass. I had mostly the same thing. There was at one point, it looked like it was underneath an underpass that uh, passes over water and then they were next to the side of a road. There was a fence. There were train tracks. I I don't know how to be more specific than that. It was right outside of Goro's truck because he was cleaning his truck. So I can add a place where one might park his or her truck when cleaning it. All right. Points for everybody. Yeah, it was right around that overpass. And what I <laughs> loved about that shot was uh, for a good chunk of the fight, it's their silhouettes. 
because they're mm-hmm. under that overpass and there's the bright uh, city skyline behind them for lack of a better word. And this was a scene like a few of the scenes in this movie that was lifted right from a Western. But instead of this gorgeous sunset behind them, their silhouettes were caused by that overpass with the contrast of light. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how this, it, mm-hmm. it is a Western, right? It's a, it's not a spaghetti Western. It's a ramen mm-hmm. Western at some level, but in addition sh- to being a comedy. Yeah. Well, that's it, the joke the director made, right? He said that very, yep. <laughs> he said that very same thing. Um, mm-hmm. And there's the, the facts of the Western, what, you know, what makes it kind of Western-y is, is the, the the aesthetic so you have those fights you have those scenes him rolling into town is very similar to the uh the early 1950s western uh george stevens shane if anybody knows that which is the same plot a guy rolls into town and helps a woman with a kid who's she's single and then at the end he rolls out right um it's that same concept and even there's like little bullhorns on the on his car if you notice that it has yes, that, that on other the top of the truck. Yeah. And so there's this, yeah, kind of um, delightful sort of love of Western, but it seems like a, a joke, right? And it's, mm-hmm, it's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a satire. And I think this is the difference between satire and parody. Satire looks to take aim at its target. Parody makes humor based upon a shared understanding. Um, and it, very oftentimes parody celebrates the thing it's, it's making fun of. And I think that's the case here. That um, you know they're using this kind of um, this kind of uh, suave loner type who swings into town and and uh, saves the damsel that type of thing in order to um, celebrate that uh, that genre while doing something new and kind of creative and kind of cool with it. Even the ramen shop almost takes the role of the saloon. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that opening fight where they eventually go outside the saloon, so to say. But it's so much fun because the whole thing takes place off camera. There's just guys being thrown back into the camera, mm-hmm. and I thought that was a really fun fight. So I'll agree with you that we had Western vibes to it, but I'm also going to throw out there: Did um, anybody imagine Crocodile Dundee when they were watching Goro with his hat <laughs> and that whole like his dynamic with the woman and everything? It it kept popping back up in my mind every time I saw him. You call those chopsticks? <laughs> He's a chopsticks, <laughs> right? Like I kept waiting for like a different voice to come out of him. <laughs> uh, my favorite thing with the hat was when he was taking a bath. Yes. That's they get caught in the rain, <laughs> and he takes a bath with his hat on. That's that's such a delightful detail. That's that's why you watch movies when a director can put a detail like that in. It just makes your he makes your world. Talking about that bath, I know uh, KJ and Rachel, you lived in Japan for a bit. That was an interesting bath. It was like short and deep. You know, what, what is that situation? Yeah, we had one of those in our apartment, actually. And it was one of the greatest baths I've ever been in because you can submerge very easily without too much water. And that's that's kind of the goal is to to be submerged in very hot water and sweat out whatever. Um, I, I wish I had one here. I really I, do. I actually just remembered that when I went to visit you. I remember because it was a weird, you had to step into it or over it. Oh yeah. 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 It's, it yeah. took a while to learn because you're, yeah. you're stepping yeah. up to get over the lip, but then it's yeah. lower than the floor. Yeah. Ah. Mm-hmm. I had knowledge. I didn't remember. <laughs> the whole bathroom is made so that like, I don't know if you noticed, but in the water was even with the edge. And so like, it's acceptable for the water to go over where I feel like here, like you're always yelling at your kids, like stop kicking the water out of the bathroom there it's supposed to go up to the edge because the whole bathroom floor has a drain in it it's meant to go up and over and then drain out so like the bathroom is part of the bath after round one everybody's tied at two points a piece we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back davy in the navy sweatshirt when i was in college i had a roommate we often had fun and got into debates i'm gonna tell a story and i'll keep it short this one's about davy's navy shirt davy took a trip to somewhere far away but then he came back on another day i went to pick him up from the place with the planes hey, davy what you wearing i'm a driving in the lane 
Davy looked down with confidence, said, I'm wearing a navy shirt and it's not red. I drove around the circle looking for navy, but I couldn't find navy, couldn't find Davy. I took another lap and the phone did ring. Davy asked, where the heck you been? I told him I saw colors of green and yellow, but I couldn't find this Davy fella. Around and around and around I went. I wondered if Davy could feel my torment. Then I saw someone do win a wavy, and wouldn't you know, it looked like Davy. I got closer, Davy standing tall, but Davy's shirt wasn't blue at all. I was about to inquire directly to Davy, but written on his shirt was the word Navy. Oh, Davy, you were always a poet. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. And we're back. Rachel, we're at the critical part of our episode where we ask the guests a key question. If you could watch this movie with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Mm, that's an easy one for me. So as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, this movie, while it's a comedy, I felt was definitely better watched with someone else um, because of the style of comedy. And uh, when I lived in Japan, I had the opportunity to go to a movie theater to watch um Mamma Mia. Thank you. To watch Mamma Mia. And I went with uh, my friend Ali and Ali and her husband were from Australia and also in Japan teaching English. And she is um very animated and has a very vibrant personality. And so it was a ton of fun to watch the movie with her in the theater because everyone in the theater just got involved in the movie and was clapping and cheering and very excited. And so I kind of wanted to recreate that experience of just having someone who had lived in Japan, so who understood a lot of the nuances. She also spoke a decent amount of Japanese. Um, so sometimes it was nice to be able to understand what they were saying on screen and recognize the difference in the subtitles and you know there was yes that was a literal translation but sometimes the meaning was different um, so I feel like she could take it to another level and just she it would be a lot of fun to talk about some of the um, things that we saw and how silly they were or ridiculous or or reminisce about uh, similar experiences that we had in Japan um, so yeah I would say Ali Baker would be my choice Oh, the Bakers would be so much fun to watch this movie with. Um, Rach, do you remember? I think we were in Himeji and we have a video of it. There was an, an older Japanese man, very nice. And there was a statue or something and it had text in Japanese and then it had text in English. And he felt very obliged to tell us what it said in English, even though he could barely get through the English. And the whole time, Ali's just egging him on, helping him out, you know, doing the teacher thing. And, and then even with Japanese words, because as you said, it felt like something out of this movie, a Japanese guy trying to explain to the foreigners what this English text says about a very traditional Japanese uh, castle. Yes, the bakers would be wonderful to watch yeah, this movie. Yeah, that with. was amazing. And it was ex exactly the experience I wanted to recreate. When, you, when you're in a Japanese cinema, is there a lot, is it a lot more interactive than in, in american cinemas my only experience was watching mama mia um so i can't speak on on large scales but she had it was the reason i went was because ali had suggested it because she had been before and she had more experience and she had said we need to go because it's a lot of fun to watch with other people so I would say it sounds like it more than more than most of the time here because she that was why we went to the theater to watch it because she was like we have to go and um, they were I mean people were cheering they were laughing it was it wasn't interactive like Rocky Horror style interactive yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was mm -hmm. definitely like you weren't just sitting there quiet for the full two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't speak for Japanese cinema, but I can speak for Japanese baseball. That is much more interactive than in the States. They have mascots, brass bands. They try to make it so that each side of the stadium is just one set of fans. So you really get the 
crowd uh, cheering and booing at different moments. It's it's crazy. Uh, we had the, as I refer to them as the keg girls, uh, these various girls had actual kegs on their uh, back and would go up and down and pour you fresh beer. So I will say that is a much more interactive experience that you might enjoy at some point in your life. It's time for question three. What does Tom Popo say Goro helped her find? Oh, locked in. I got nothing. Like the first half of the movie, second half of the movie, are hints allowed? Yeah, hints are allowed uh, for certain guests. Uh, second half of the movie. <laughs> second okay. half of the movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can recall roughly when it happened. That's what I'm trying to see. Uh... I'm just going to make up an answer, so I'm locked in. I guess I'll be locked in, too. He helped her find her soul um he helps her find happiness her ladder he helped her find her ladder yes that is correct points That's go to it. tom That's it was one of the it. few serious scenes in this movie right um tom Pubbles in that wonderful 80s japanese outfit um they're kind of on that date it's it's one of the only somber scenes in the movie um and she starts talking about ladders which i thought was it was kind of nice, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm just not sure if it fit in with the rest of the movie. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they, it's kind of a, a lovely little scene. It isn't in violation, I think, of their, their characters. I mean, he's kind of this, this gruff, rough guy who, uh, and his backstory sort of speaks to that, right? And, you know, he's kind of the gruff, rough Westerner whose past is somewhat tragic. You know, we have that there. And for her, you know, it it is kind of what he's done for her. He has helped her find a sort of purpose in life that, you know, not, maybe not a purpose in life to speak that grandly, but um, he's helped her recognize that she is a craftswoman, that she can be this, that she can become a master at something that has practical purpose in the world. Um, and, and, you know, that's, it's right. They're, they're both, their stories speak to, um, something that I think resonates throughout the movie. I, I sort of like that scene. I agree with Tom that it didn't betray their character arcs or development or anything about them. So I, I thought it was fine inclusion. It was a different flow than a lot of the rest of the movie because it really didn't have comedic value. It was a serious scene. But other than that, I think it still fit well within the film. Yeah, I think it kept the theme of food and how food brings people together and their relationship with food. I think it, it, it followed that th theme, but it, it was, what struck me about it was that right, that red and black outfit that may have been the first time we saw her in something that wasn't some form of traditional or uniform. Um, and so it, it just made her feel like a little bit of a different person or like you were seeing a different side of her because up until that point she was portraying um a very specific type of Japanese woman um and so it almost stepped into like uh the woman and the man um who had the food experience in the hotel like it, it was kind of mirroring them a little bit it was, it was much more of a date yeah and up to that point, it, it had been kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a working amateur relationship. Um, but I think it also fits the theme not only of food, but also of this kind of idea of, uh, of mastery, right? Which also, I think, speaks to, I don't know if this is a, a question coming up, but speaks to the beginning of the picture, right? Where we are told within two frames that you know we're watching a movie and part of the the movie experience is uh you know having the right food not being interrupted by sound or anything like that um really being a kind of a, a master amateur just to speak contradictorily right like enjoying the movie in a, in a kind of perfect way and um that kind of living as a craftsperson which is you know what uh Tampupu, Tampopo uh, ends up doing um, is is what Goro has brought to her, right? Goro is a very enthusiastic 
amateur in the sense that he's deeply invested in that which he loves, which is these, these kind of ramen places. Um, he's, he's very knowledgeable. He has kind of critical participation in that. And he brings that enthusiasm to her and is able to work with her to, to find a sort of um, purpose in the world. And eventually this does not manifest romantically. It just becomes the, the victory of success. She becomes a, she becomes a successful ramen chef. Um, you know, and, and that scene speaks to that. It speaks to a person kind of finding purpose through a craft, which seems to be exactly what the director is doing in, in making this picture. It has a kind of meta reference tied into it. It's time for question four. Hi, this question is subjective, which means I'll ask a question, everybody will give an answer, and I'll pick which one I like the best regardless. So the Tom wins? So, well, excuse me. A guess. You know who I am? <laughs> I think Rachel. 13 wins. months, dude. 13 I, months. I. I, I, I <laughs> I, I will say I think Nick loses. That's that's what... uh, that's probably what I would think. <laughs> All right, and points go no. All right, so the question is, what do you think was the most appetizing food in the movie? I'm gonna lock in. Do you mean appetizing or erotic? Appetizing, like you want to eat it, gonna... not you know. <laughs> Only in this film is that a a, a real question. <laughs> Does it have to be a? food in context or is it just a any type of food something from the movie you were watching the movie and thought oh i could eat that right now that looks awesome okay i'm locked in it's deep competition here so i'm gonna need a moment i have an answer that will be wrong so i need to think of one that could potentially be right there's no wrong answers here nick there's just no points awarded for you there's just <laughs> nick's wrong answer <laughs> there was a lot of ramen okay so like i feel like <laughs> Okay, I got it. Locked in. All right, Tom, what do you have? I'm I'm going to say the ramen, but my specific example is one of our first vignettes when we see the sensei training the young man on how to eat ramen. And I, I think that scene is both ridic is ridiculous, sort of poking fun at expertise there, but also that's that really made me hungry for ramen. <laughs> he's, he's, he really fetishizes every aspect of the food and that it, it worked. I got a little excited. <laughs> well, first off, you said it was the not the erotic answer. Tom's getting a little excited about this uh, scene, so I'm not sure. But my answer, definitely not on the erotic, but on the looking very tasty, is the mochi. I would not choke on it because I would know what I was getting into, but how gooey and delicious that stuff looked. It was, it was wonderful. So I would say definitely that made me want to try that dish. I'm fascinated by your answer, Nick, and I'm going to bring you mochi one time. I'm very curious. Didn't it look delicious? It almost looked like you said, like it almost looked like stretchy, like a marshmallow. I can't stand it. it. It's, it's bad. It's not bad. People love it, but it tastes like, imagine overcooked rice pounded to its life, end of its life. That's what it tastes like. No, it's pretty it good. Looked, yeah, no, it's good. It, it looked delicious. It's got the texture of like a, I've, I've heard it described as like a tennis ball. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's really good. I, I'm a fan. Hey, we didn't say what things actually taste like. We saw what we saw on the screen that looked like it might taste good. Mm. Okay. The texture of a tennis ball is your positive advertisement for this. <laughs> and the points don't go to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go, I'm going to take a different approach. Um, I picked the food they ate on their date. It was kind of like, um, like pork belly that they then wrapped in, in the lettuce. And I think what I liked about it was that there wasn't comedy around it, that it wasn't fetishized. I don't know how to say that word, fetishized, fetishized. Um, it wasn't like they weren't pulling it apart. They weren't stretching it. Like I don't like that when people do that with food. So it was the, the it looked very juicy. Um, it was also very sweet because she, I don't know if you remember, but she, she was making the wraps for him 
but not in a, like, I'm a woman and this is what I have to do, but it was a, an endearing, like, oh, let me make this for you and hand it. And there, there wasn't a lot of pomp and circumstance. It was just, she was doing it and handing it to him and then he was eating it. So I also liked, it really just felt like a sweet date where they were both there because they wanted to be there and they were just enjoying this meal together. Um, so there was lots of ramen and the ramen was looked amazing. And I agree with you, uh, Tom, I really wanted rum too. But yeah, that, that particular scene just really, I was like, oh, that's really cute. And I really want that. Yeah, that, that meat looks so good. The, I want to be able to pick apart Rachel's answer like she picked apart my answer. Bring it on, Nick. I'm ready. <laughs> however, I'm ready. However, <laughs> however, I do remember going to an establishment that had the food cooking on coals when I was mm -hmm. in Japan with you guys. So I don't know why I didn't think of that scene. It did bring up memories of that type of delicious food. Yeah, that sounds So really I will say good. that. But I also remember Tom's scene with the uh, delicious ramen and how to respect your ramen and appreciate your ramen as you mm. are enjoying your ramen. So I, I'm making it hard for KJ because I'm not getting the points. Yeah, not that hard. Points go to Tom and Rachel. Um, the ramen in this movie made me want to have ramen so bad. And the yakiniku uh, was was that date. The um, They kind of bring raw meat to your table and you cook it. And oh man, it looked good in that scene raw and it looked good cooked and the le it, it was yeah it was great is it pig well when we went you kind of picked different parts of the cow meats and different yeah. other oh, meats okay. you could get yeah um mm -hmm. but yeah they, they had pork they had pork belly they had um but things. but that that word you you just said it is not referring to a specific animal it's referring to a cooking process or a preparation process yeah i'm pretty sure yaki niku so yaki is to cook and niku is meat I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. You're cooking on coals, like almost like a coals with a grill on okay, top so of it. Okay, so it's that experience. It's like it's like indoor grilling. Right, at your at your table. Okay. Yep. And you could do that with a number of, of meats. It, it's not mm -hmm. specific. Yeah. And I think, okay. I know lettuce wrap is common, but were there other type of wraps or is it just lettuce wrap? This is very important for our show. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, I do remember the option of lettuce. Um, I don't remember other wraps. Do you remember it at all, Rach? No, but in a lot of Asian culture, like in Thai, in Thai, in Vietnamese, in Vietnam, in Japan, like wrapping things in lettuce as opposed to a tortilla is more the norm. Where here we would wrap like as tacos and things, but it's much more, or lettuce or other greenery. It doesn't have to be specifically lettuce. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other green leafy vegetables that you would wrap food in. Yeah, so a movie about food I think they did a great job, right? There's other movies about food that don't don't stand up to this one, but the, almost every scene, I mean, there was some weird scenes, but almost every scene, you wanted to be eating what they were eating. Even in the weird scenes, they were about food. Everything was about food. I'm not going to talk about the egg yolk. I, I know say, that's I what you're thinking of. That egg yolk, yeah. I'm not going to talk <laughs> about that. But what I'm saying is that was the, the, the primary, dare I say, ingredient to this film was we're just going to reference food. And you could see that even if there was comedic elements, there was a true love affair with food. And, and the, the, the erotic scenes, and there's, there's two of them. And for our audience who hasn't seen this movie, who's everyone uh, i'm pretty sure kgar you haven't seen this movie um but it, it's there's these this gangster and his his lady and the gangster's dressed in all white he looks like john houston from chinatown and they have these two scenes where they have sex or are making out while eating food um and i think the the kind of erotic charge to to that um, the, the eros, you know, eros is a word for love that has a kind of sensual, even sexual aspect compared to um, like phylos or something like that, which is is more kind of disinterested love, a sort of respect and, and reverence for something. And this movie treats food like eros, right? It's those sexual elements are really important to understand the feeling these people have for food. It isn't, it isn't, um, it isn't a craft the way uh, like a Renaissance artist pursues a craft, right? Something above us, something that stands there, something you marvel at, like you go to the go to, to see the David or something like that, and you stand there and you marvel and whatnot. Food is something to to be 
absorb to you know have it touch you you touch it It, it's very um it's sensual in that way and so bringing in this kind of this eros this erotic element right at the beginning with this gangster and his girl as they're you know eating sugar off each other's nipples and what about the dancing raw prawns on her belly (laughs) yeah yeah he tickles her you know some and the the yolk they share is is gross oh my gosh that. that scene went on for a while yeah it's two scenes. The yoke comes in the next. I had to look away with the yoke. I'll, I'll say that. But I think that that erotic charge to it is everywhere in this movie. I don't think there's a scene in which we step back as um, as appreciators of food. We're appreciators of food, yes, but we are also indulgers. All right, Tom, you are taking this episode with six points. Rachel in second with four and Nick with two. Well done, everyone. All right. Congratulations, Tom. Congrats, Tom. Mm-hmm. I did it. I did it, guys. <laughs> it's time for Movie Rent. So I, I, um, so I was wondering what you guys thought of the beginning. The beginning has a, uh, the beginning is a direct address to us. And a lot of the, the film is filmed almost with the actors looking at the camera or, or just off from the camera. And in the opening scene, we meet the gangster going to the theater his three gangster subordinates prepare his food um and he threatens someone for eating curry chips because that'll <laughs> disrupt his his viewing experience um and from there it jumps into the 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 sensei explaining to the the kid you know how to enjoy food and from there we find out it's a book that um that what's his name gun gun is reading to goro as they're driving and there's this this deliberate attention to story that happens even before we get into the story right this attention to the the filmmaker as you know kind of maker of what we're what we're absorbing right right at this point i was wondering what people thought of that yeah, I agree completely. And and to go back to Monty Python, it's similar to the Holy Grail when in the opening credits, they're addressing the audience. They're telling the story of the moose, not to anybody in the movie, but to you, the audience. So right from the bat, they're looking down the barrel of the camera saying, oh, you're watching a movie too? Great, because you're going to enjoy it. Here it comes. The other scene that I really enjoyed that did this is when they meet um, I guess the homeless people, they're all kind of older and they're oh, also yeah. obsessed with food. You feel like you're sitting the there gourmets. with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the gourmet. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're not there. I mean, they are talking to Goro and Tom Popo, I guess, but they're also talking directly to the audience about their experiences and their, you know, it's got mm-hmm. that 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 vaudeville feel a little bit of uh, we're, we're taking a break from the movie to ex- either explain something to you or enjoy a moment with you or it, you know, it, it felt mm-hmm. like they're often talking directly to the audience. I was going to say, when the uh, when she, uh, Tampopo, and Goro don't finish the food at that one ramen place, and they start yelling at them, um, the, the ca- they're looking right at the camera, just about. And what they're saying is really interesting. They're saying, like, uh, you are amateurs, you don't understand. And, you know, her response, which is brilliant, which is, everybody who eats this is an amateur. <laughs> you know, everybody who's coming here is an amateur. And mm-hmm. she's saying that right at the camera, which is kind of like looking at us because we are not filmmakers. Most people, <laughs> almost everyone watching this movie is also an amateur in some way or, or possibly a dilettante, right? Um, and and that, that also seemed to be communicating in this, these direct address scenes. When you start off with a fourth wall break, it shows the audience that anything can happen. At least that's how I take it. So we know already what we're kind of getting into. Whereas there, when you have a movie that there's just an occasional one or one maybe halfway through, here we know they've set the stage that, okay, buckle up, enjoy the ride. Yeah, chaos is a, is a big part of this. And it's controlled chaos, right? Because we have a plot, right? We have a, we have a rocky story, so to speak, going on here. Um, and we're able to just sort of um, jump away from that and do, you know, kind of a, a zany things like that. Um, you know, I, I also like how, speaking of that direct address in the beginning, how uh, the the gangster tells us, the audience, that um, he doesn't want to be disturbed because he imagines when he dies, 
he'll see a short film and he'll really enjoy it. And then when he when he does eventually die and he's shot like a billion times by someone who can't possibly be there, like, the, you know, the, the <laughs> spatial arrangements are impossible. There's just bullets hitting him. You don't even see the bullets hitting him. You just hear them. You know, it's 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 corniness for the sake of corniness. Um, and, and it combines the reference, the meta reference. He's, he's, you know, now imagining his death film um, with his love of food. He's also imagining eating these kind of, um, uh, they're like pork sausages, right? <laughs> like yam pork sausages. Yeah. Yam sausages. <laughs> they're, yeah. They're eating these, yeah, these pigs are eating yams and he's imagining having those as sausage with, with the, his, the woman in white who he's, you know, been romancing this whole time, but mostly he's been romancing her. Um, you know, and it kind of combines that, that sort of love of, of filmmaking and, and love of being a dilettante, right? Not just being a filmmaker, but being the person who goes into the theater and respects the institution of the theater and seeing the movie. You know, he's not a filmmaker. He's a guy who knows how to enjoy a movie, right? And he does that while fantasizing about being the guy who knows how to enjoy a great meal. And those two, um, those two bits of, of fantasy, those two bits of uh, dilettantism combine in that scene. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's also corny as hell, which I like. Tom, I have a question. You said um, that something about it being rocky, did you mean actually like the movie about the guy in Philadelphia or did you mean about like, you know, not a good movie? Oh yeah, like yeah, R Rocky as in um, the the movie with the boxer with Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> so it's funny you say that because very early on in the notes I took while I was watching it, I literally wrote the Rocky of Ramen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's That's weird really that we good. both picked up that same vibe, or and it was yeah. early on in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, she does the training thing, right? Where she has to get the food to him in a certain time and raise her hand to indicate that <laughs> she's done. She has yeah. to move the the um the water bucket back and forth you know it's she has to go running for for no good reason as far as i could tell it's very rocky yeah yeah he needed stamina it. tom that's what he was training her. in order to be a great chef she needed stamina <laughs> yeah yeah i i think but i i think like you know it's it's the like you're saying it's the rocky of ramen um it's it's also loves the conventions that movies like rocky put out there it it loves the movie Rocky, right? And it's you know that's it's more important than do you do you need stamina? To be, yeah, you know, to be do you need like a lot of upper body strength to be a ramen cook? <laughs> Maybe we're telling too many uh, boring stories from our time in Japan. But another ramen story that I have: we were we were out to dinner one time. Um, it was Rachel and I, and then a few of the other uh, teachers that we worked with that who were Japanese, and everybody ordered um, ramen. But I ordered stamina ramen, which I didn't really know what it was. That's why I wanted to see what it was. And they all started making fun of me so much. It was unbelievable how much they were. You know, they're usually very polite, very. But all of a sudden, it was free game because this this gaijin ordered stamina ramen, which nobody knew what it was. I asked them what it was, and they, they were like, I don't know. What is stamina ramen? So I thought you were going to say they put something in it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I think if I remember correctly, it was it was very spicy. So you needed the stamina to get through uh. the. Oh. The spiciness, which I did not have, I was not equipped for stamina ramen. Mm. Nobody knew what it was, though. So it's not a, not like a common thing. And yeah, not that I, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, um, I guess the towards the end of the movie when they were trying to come up with like her menu or whatever. I, I don't know if you noticed, but they only they settled on like three or four things like that's very common in Japan. You go into a, a restaurant and they don't have these extensive diner menus. They have like a few things that they specialize in. And so um, I think the stamina ramen was probably just like, why would you ever order that? Like you just order, you know, whatever the whatever that ramen shop is known for or like, you know, one of two or three things the extra things are probably usually what foreigners would order because that's what we do. We want, you know, we order all the things on the menu. Yeah. Th there's a great sense of, um, there's a, there's a great sense of perfecting that one thing and doing it right all the time over and over. That seemed to be what, you know, what, what's going on with this movie as well is, is, you know, the kind of quest for perfection. That's her, that's her stairway, right? That's her ladder. 
uh, is, you know, perfecting this one thing, which is kind of lovely. I, I, you know, I think, you know, like just doing, doing one small thing that is useful to people. People will eat this food. They'll like it. But doing that one small thing correctly. There's a documentary called Jiro Dreams of Sushi that it's explores that. Very I don't good. know if you've seen it. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and it is quite lovely, Tom. But even in that documentary, I was like, oh, Jiro, like you've never done anything else. How do you know this was the, but yeah. Hey, he found his ladder. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's that that's sort of you. Inter so I see what you're saying, but where you, you create, you know, this idea of spice, uh, the, the variety of life is spice, right? The spice of life is variety. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you do like a bunch of, you know, you do a bunch of different things and you're, you're very experienced. You're very you, you have a lot of breath, but not a lot of depth. Right. And I, I think the idea of. Um, honing in on a discipline, on, on a, maybe even a way of living, if we want to call a way of living a, a potential discipline, um, you know, gives, gives someone kind of direction or purpose um, that I think this movie appreciates. And I think Juro Dreams of Sushi also too, right? It, it's doing that one thing perfectly well. Um, you know, and yes, granted, you can flood yourself with questions of of experience and should I have had a, a more diversity of experience? Should I have done A instead of B, et cetera? But there, there's such a there's such a great amount of experiences you could have gone down, uh, different roads you could have gone down that that question sort of can't be exhausted. Right. It's, it's a way of setting yourself up for failure because you could always have done more. You could have always done taken the other road. You could have always married the other person. And the, the sort of commitment to a practice seems to be what this movie and what, what Juro, the, the documentary, are about. They're about that kind of um, that kind of maybe you could call them blinders, but the 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 joy in that commitment. I believe there's also a cultural element to that. I can't remember the name of the documentary that I was watching about Japanese knife making. And there's generations of people who are focused on certain techniques, mostly using hand tools, but also using some modern tools. Same thing. That's what they do to create the perfect knife. Anyway, yeah, I guess we could talk about um, him driving away, Goro, uh, uh, you know, seeing his success and turning around and leaving. Um, you know, which is also something from Shane, right? That's the the great Western from the fifties. Is Shane kind of fulfills his mission? He says goodbye. The you know the daughter, uh, the the son of the woman he helped, um, chases after him. Says Shane, don't go. But you know he's done his job and he has to move on. That also reminded me of this is an interesting reference of another movie we watched with James as our guest. Mad Max Fury Road. Now, you may be wondering, how does this tie to Mad Max? The reason I like this is at the end when he succeeded in helping everyone with his task, he just drives off. We, we In that movie, we just see him kind of disappear. But in general, the character of Mad Max accomplishes his goal and then moves off into myth and legend. Yeah, Mad Max is kind of a Western, certainly. I think even before he got into the car, like the whole, the beginning of the end of the movie, right? So once she's like successfully made ramen and customers are now coming in and they're lining up. And so you you see everybody seated at the counter and along the wall is the team of people that have essentially helped her get to where she is. And they slowly start leaving. Um, uh, it felt very Ocean's Eleven to me at that end scene when they're all standing looking at the water fountain show mm -hmm. at the Bellagio and then they slowly peel off one at a time. Even the music, it, it, it evoked this feeling of the end of Ocean's Eleven. And so they all go off, you know, one goes on a bike, one goes walking, one gets in the car, um, one's running alongside the car. So I feel like multiple times they were pulling from other tropes of other movies, right? Because Ocean's Eleven that we know it as is the George Clooney version, but that it was a remake of the original Rat Pack. Um, so that came out long before this movie. Um, and so it just, it really, it was kind of fun to see the movie end in that way. Same concept, they fulfilled their roles and now they're moving on to the next adventure. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the man with no name does the same thing too, right? The Clint Eastwood, the the original, the the archetypical spaghetti western, <laughs> um, does that as well. What was interesting about this film, though, when we were talking a little bit about the comedic style, we've seen other Japanese films that have comedic elements to it, but this was completely different than that. That's why I said it was more like, even when you said Monty Python or some Western, I had some Mel Brooks moments. It had that kind of vibe, not this, things are moving at a very fast pace. Oh, loud noise, you know, <laughs> like you're like crazy. Act. It, it didn't have that same thing. That it's not Mike Kuhan. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. It's not Michael Hahn. Well, this came out 20 years before those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's... Yeah. And well, it's we've a... only seen a limited amount, or at least I can only speak for myself. I've only seen a limited amount of that material, the, the comedies from mm. Japan. And I think what we've seen has fo followed a different pattern than what we have seen in this film. Yeah. And yes, there is a time gap because I think the other ones you recommended for the show were more recent than this. Yeah, it is. I, I agree with you, Nick. Like the there is a little Mel Brooks thing, especially when they that one scene where they're slurping the noodles and it goes. Whoop, is it? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah the there's sound. a sound yeah. effect. When yeah. They, yeah. And also the Monty Python thing is real clear. It feels like a, yeah. such a reference. Um, what's interesting about movies and, and kind of influence or adaptation is that there really does feel like a much more of a. Uh, a, a quick exchange rate between West and East. And I, I don't want to just generalize to West and East, but various cultures when it comes to, to movie language, it seems like there's a lot of, certainly a lot of diversity and a lot of cultural competency that's necessary for seeing movies out of, out of your culture and out of your country. There's just a tremendous amount of exchange that, you know, probably doesn't exist before, you know, circa 1920 or whatnot. Um, which makes movies like a lot of fun, right? Because there is just such a, it, it's such much, it, it's so much more of a, of a mixing bowl in, in terms of uh, cultural influence. This movie also um, felt like it was paying homage to a, a few Yasujiro Ozu movies. So he did Tokyo Story. And mm -hmm. in Tokyo Story, people are constantly kind of looking away and then looking up to the camera and saying their dialogue, mm, those mm -hmm. extreme close-ups. And that that seemed to happen a lot in mm. in this one. And then uh, uh, Yasujiro Ozu also um, did a silent film. I mean, a few silent films, but the, the one that I've seen was called I Was Born But. Um, and the, the little bit where they go and make that omelet in this movie mm -hmm. it's like the bum mm -hmm. and the kid that to me felt like it was almost a scene from i was born but because you know it's silent they're playing the piano music and they're doing mm -hmm. the thing so i think they were also paying homage to a lot of older films so not mm -hmm. only was this 20 years before some of the other films we've seen i think they were calling back to even older films is why it mm -hmm. felt kind of yeah. different what crossed my mind with this film versus some of the other Japanese comedies is I think a, a wider Western audience would be much more receptive to this type of comedy than some of the more recent comedies. So whether they were taking influences from source material that we're already familiar with, or even if it was Japanese source material, it blended better to what, I don't know, comedy is expected to be in a film in, in this audience. I, that's just my take on it. It had a lot more international acclaim, right? This was, I mean, it's on Criterion. Like, yeah, it's right on Criterion. There, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess that speaks to what you're talking about, Nick. That seems to mm. it seem to seem yeah. to work. I keep submitting Michael Hahn to Criterion. They haven't pulled that trigger yet, but then yeah. No, oh. what's the other one? I, what's the other one that? Oh, why don't you play in hell? Yeah, that one too. Oh keep, my yeah. <laughs> Wait, is that a real, is that a real statement? No. What? Okay. <laughs> well, I believed I, you. <laughs> it's like, oh, you could just do that. Yeah, Ooh. you just submit it. You just email it. You just send him a tweet. I don't know what you he's just, doing down here. You just send him a tweet, you know? That's all you do. Yeah. In 13 months, from, I don't know what kind of connections he's made. You just keep sending it from at Talking Studios. Yeah. I don't know. Got a lot of respect. Oh, God. What if we take oh, over Criterion? <laughs> they, they, just, they just hire us to do it. I think there's a better <laughs> chance of us getting a Criterion sponsorship than them, us taking them over. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking for both. <laughs> <laughs> Criterion brought to you by <laughs> at Talking <laughs> Studios. <laughs> Next up, Super Troopers. <laughs> uh, um, 
What did you think of the main actress of this film? <laughs> uh, funny you should ask. Oh, she's oh, she is wonderful, I, and I forgot her name just because you asked me. She's so wonderful, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> what a lovely response. No, I I think like I you find yourself like rooting for her so hard through this movie. And she's just so, she's so kind of like, um, uh, I, I like kind of moves with the, with the action in, in such a, a kind of delightful way. She has this nice, the kind of bubbly thing. Like I, I love when she um, throws her hands up to indicate that she's finished when she's being timed to do, to do ramen, the kind of the energy she does that, and I, I that scene when they're uh, confronting the bad ramen chefs, and she's kind of telling them off, but hiding behind Goru as she's doing it, she kind of ducks behind him. Um, that sort of little dance, that kind of energy she brings, yeah, God, she was she was wonderful in it. Um, yeah, you definitely root for Tam Popo through the whole movie, though. You, you... Yeah, but just this 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 actress played it with this kind of um with this yeah kind of uh i don't know how to describe the, her her energy it was just um it was very it was, childlike but yeah, not yeah, immature yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. endearing yeah. yeah yeah even the scene where she does the things it hands up when she's yeah. like all done like i had flashbacks to like teaching tiny japanese children and <laughs> they would finish their activity and they would say, and yatta is like, I'm all done. And they would do that. They would go yatta. Like they put their <laughs> hands up and, and say like, I'm done. Like I finished. And, mm. and she like, she, she had that down. So it was very childlike. Yeah. Her name is Naboku Miyamoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She, she's also interviewed on the Criterion channel. If you want to, you want to check that out, but yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. There is a, there is a kind of ch a childlike, um, and she's also very credulous. She sort of she goes with what this kind of ragtag team of experts, quote unquote experts, or, you know, or participating amateurs say. So I yeah, I I couldn't stop watching her. I I kind of found her performance somewhat hypnotic. I don't think I've ever heard someone use the word credulous. I've only heard incredulous, Tom. Thank you for oh. <laughs> I don't think Cred I ever thought about that. Credore to believe. Yeah, I've never heard it. only people say incredulous, like that's incredulous. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm incredulous. I, I, yeah, credulous, I think, like willing to believe or quick to believe. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Credulous, having or showing too great a readiness to believe things. Mm -hmm. The more you know. I really also like how this movie ends on food as well, but a different type of thing nursing. I thought that was such a, such a nice little, little moment of, um, of someone who's not really aware at all, who doesn't have literally the intellectual capacity to be a, 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 a gourmet, um, but who's just understanding any kind of affection and, and sensuality through food. Or that's your kind of first real, um, real satisfaction of desire, right? And we could think of through our lives, how, how much you know desire we have and it's satisfied or not satisfied and the different um the different ways in which that feeling manifests and it, it initiates with needing milk right with needing kind of food and that kind of that aspect of nursing i thought that was just a, a nice little way of of closing out the film so what's funny about that end sequence they start there and I'm wondering, okay, are they going to go somewhere else? So I just flip forward a little bit more into the credits to see if they move. And all they do is zoom in on the baby suckling. <laughs> they just commit even harder to that concept. So it was interesting, but you're right from the depth level of what they were trying to accomplish. But on the face value, I was just like, okay, that's, that's how we're ending this. I loved it. I thought it surprised me. Um, I think more so that I hadn't ever made that connection before or just the fact that I hadn't really thought about it on that level that there is this relationship with food from day one and the whole movie was about relationship with food and how that changes and um, professionally and also personally. Um, but it's it's so true and I've heard people talk about before in the world of when talking about different addictions that people have, right? And there's like alcohol and there's smoking and there's drugs, et cetera, et cetera. 
And food, they say, is the hardest one to break because you can't eliminate it, right? You can eliminate gambling, you can eliminate shopping, you can eliminate all these other things. You can't eliminate the need for food. And so from day one, there's this relationship we have with food and it's this lifelong journey and dance that we have of needing it to fuel our body, but also wanting to enjoy it and having it be parts of our life and and that changes. And so it, I, I think it just really caught me off guard as like, oh, yeah, like it makes so much sense for a movie about food to end on breastfeeding and, you know, the very natural thing that is eating. I'd like to once again congratulate our winner of the week, which is Tom. Congrats. Hey. We're very enthusiastic about our winners here at Talking Pictures very, Trivia. Very. On another note, check out our website, TalkingPicturesTrivia.com, for more information about us and our episodes. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts as well as our YouTube channel. We are extremely grateful for any positive reviews as those help others like you find us. If you like what you hear, remember to like and subscribe to our show. What is the best bowl of ramen you've ever had and why? Let's continue the conversation on Twitter at Talking Studios. Have additional thoughts? Email us at TalkingPicturesTrivia at gmail.com or give us a call at 201-467-8679 for a chance to be featured on one of our future From the Listeners episodes. Thanks again, Rachel, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You can find me on Twitter at ThomasLayman15. I also do uh, Talking Pictures B-Side, which is a, a podcast we release a few times a month, um, which just extends the conversation about this. And I, I'm doing a B-Side on um, this picture as well. So check that out. And you can find me on Twitter at KJ1000. I can also be found on Twitter at The Nicknamed. Join us next time when we discuss Tom's recommendation from 1977, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Should be a fun one. Talk to you then. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I've been doing these morning walks because my understanding is my circadian rhythms are off because I'm not getting any sun in the morning. Mm. So I've been walking into the sunlight every morning. And so are you, are you staying up late or are you getting up early? Like what part of it is I'm that? getting up very early. Uh, mm. Not very early. And I'm staying up late, Tom. You don't sleep. You don't I'm sleep. You've Switch never slept. The caffeine you you have, the, I was going to say, you have coffee running through your veins. <laughs> sunlight in the morning. Like... <laughs> Not gonna do a thing, Tom. <laughs> Listen, I can't. I can't give Tom health advice because he's hitting the gym a lot yeah, more and than he's I am these days. Of the four of us. But if you're looking far. at things to keep you a little bit more even, it might be the caffeine. That might be the first thing to look at. Well, I, well I'm, I'm using now just on tea? Wednesday nights. Like, yeah. <laughs> herbal tea is helping. Um, I'm so not good. having. I'm not having caffeine oh, after no. four. Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 I'm not oh, having caffeine oh. after four. That's actually, no, that is actually a big step. Yeah, that's that a, big a big step. step. Yeah. yeah, that's a big step. I made it before the show today with the intent of having some, and it's just sitting Herbal there, or it. other? No, other, uh, uh, coffee. Um, oh, the, oh, er oh. the herbal tea is no caffeine. It's herbal tea. It's, yeah. it's flowers. Um, <laughs> it's only palatable because of equal. He I picks think. them at 5 a.m. during his walk. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> it's circadian. <laughs>